basically what happened was I fell madly in love and I started a relationship with a wonderful woman. Interesting, when I walked into a room uh, of people who were very inclusive and pro-gay the other day, they literally had a heart attack because they were wondering what on earth I was doing there and could that really be Jane and Sam? And it took them some time to recover themselves and actually realise that I had seriously changed my views. So I was appointed to the Archbishop's Council in 1999 um, as someone who'd had no previous experience with the Church of England hierarchical structures, but who was very, very active in my own um, very young, lively evangelical church in South London, in St Paul's Onslow Square, which is part of HTB. And I felt very called to put my name forward to council and through a whole very unusual set of circumstances, uh, many of which made me want to run a mile, I found myself brought on board this group of 19. And people used to ask me, what was my remit there? What was I there to do? And I, I knew that actually, yes, I had strategic consultancy skills and I was a media consultant, I'd been at the BBC, but really I was female, I was young, I, I was under 50, and I wasn't ordained, and therefore I ticked various boxes. And I realised that put me in a very special place, that I, in a sense, could act as a court jester, someone who could speak truth to power, who could point out that actually, had anybody noticed that our, ch our churches were losing young people, that our buildings were falling down, that our clergy were really struggling, and that we really needed to get down on our knees and ask God for uh, his help. And as such, I became someone that the parachurch units, like the Evangelical Alliance, New Wine, HDB, felt they could do business with. Your views on sexuality then were very orthodox, weren't they? Absolutely. I believed very passionately that it was either sec you, you either uh, believed in God or that you were able to enjoy a homosexual relationship. They were extremely black and white. I did not believe it was compatible to be gay and a Christian. And that was the environment I, brought up, I was brought up in. Jane, when you were on the council, you were really at the heart of the church's government and perceived by people like me as one of the most powerful people in the church. When did you leave the council and why? Well, I was originally asked to do three years, a term of three years, and then I was asked if I'd stay on for another three years, and that uh, took me to the end of 2004. And we were reflecting what the best thing to do was. I actually felt that I'd done what I'd been called to do, and more importantly, I was actually becoming part of the institution. And that meant that I didn't have the prophetic voice that I felt I could have. So I felt it was right to bow down. There was nothing wrong with that. The expectation was I'd done the two terms. But more importantly, I felt it was the right time to come off because I wasn't able to speak truth to power in the way that I felt I'd done in the past. Some of your closest friends were evangelical. Are still evangelical. Are still evangelical, <laughs> absolutely. Can you give us some of the um, hotshot names? Well... I suppose on council, my closest friend and confidant was Philip Giddings, who helped form Ang Anglican Mainstream, and Bishop Michael Nazarelli, who I sat with both on Trinity Theological College, steering group and council. Um, but I was very active in New Wine, so with John Coles and uh, HDB with Nicky Gumbel and Tricia and Nicky Lee, all of whom I used to meet quite regularly, um, David Pitchers. Um, and then there was the more charismatic end. I was very involved with Prayer for the Nations and Julie Anderson's, Cindy Jacobs, Roger Mitchell from the States, very active within the Evangelical Alliance. Joel Edwards was one of my great confidants too. Frankly, it would be true to say, Ruth, that anybody who was anyone in the Evangelical Pentecostal world were very, very close friends of mine. So towards... Uh, the time just before I came out, um, I would frequently go up for prayer at church, quite normal at the end of the service asking for prayer. And it's quite difficult because you have to always sort of explain what you want prayer for. And the constant feeling I had was being prayed for and then trying to cast something out of me. It was like casting myself out of myself. It was, nothing was going to budge and people would give up and not quite sure what to do. And I'd be left feeling really awful and bad and that there was something wrong with me. I'm sure they didn't mean me to feel like that, but we all felt such failures because nothing was changing and nothing was happening. Basically what happened was I fell madly in love and I started a relationship with a wonderful woman who I was with for six years and I personally would have loved to have been with much longer than that. So was that your first relationship? First proper major long-term relationship and to be fair six years is quite good talking to many of my friends because there's an awful lot of baggage that you need to work through, especially if you're in your 40s and you've never had a relationship with someone before. 
Um, but I believe that was God-given in so many ways, and I think what so many people saw was the transformation in me, about me becoming fully alive, fully myself, fully at peace. But um, the truth is, when I met her, I hadn't told anybody. I mean, no one. In fact, I was meeting her really to sort of see, am I gay? Is this actually really what I crave and I want? But of course, when I fell madly in love and I realised it was, I didn't quite know how best to handle it. And obviously the first thing was my family. And she and I went back uh, to my parents for Easter. I asked if I could bring a friend. I thought my parents had probably guessed. Um, but uh, according to them, they hadn't. And when I wrote to them after the holiday to explain that uh, we were actually in a relationship, they really were quite shocked. I then realised I needed to take some advice as to how to handle this. Because I thought it would be quite a major piece of news. And I actually went to go and see... Uh, a senior bishop who'd been a very dear friend of mine on the Archbishop's Council, who had been making himself comments about how evangelicals needed to be more grey and less black and white on this issue. And he very graciously agreed to, tell, uh, to see me and was so supportive. And he suggested that actually it would be best for me to write my own story uh, and the reasons for my decisions and to take charge of that and to send it to the key uh, people I'd been very engaged with, so my friends on the Archbishop's Council, senior evangelical leaders across the church. And I did that, asking them to keep that private and confidential. And I think the general feeling was, because I had removed myself from public life, I had, was not involved in the church in any way, people respected uh, that decision. I had been praying for years for God to give me the grace to be celibate. I began to accept that actually I probably was just attracted to women, but therefore it meant that I needed to learn how to be happily single. And that really nearly killed me. I could not cope with the loneliness and the craving within me. Most people say for sex, no, not for that, for intimacy, for being uniquely special to someone. Genesis 2 is absolutely clear about the fact that it's not good for us to be alone. And God himself can't meet that need. That's why he brings first the animals, and we recognise that the animals uh, don't meet that need for Adam, and then he creates a helpmeet. He creates someone who is uniquely special. So, and that relationship I know has now come to an end. Sadly. But you're come, moving back into public life and into the church, hence talking to me and coming out publicly for the first time. So what is happening now? Why this um, development? Well, you're right. In um, September, just after Vicky Beeching came out, I've been praying about when would be the right time for me to engage. I always felt it would be right for me to re-engage at some point, but I knew that I'd, um, I'd know when. And it suddenly felt that I actually needed to start meeting some people, but I didn't know who. You, you need to understand, I also thought I was the only gay evangelical woman probably in the world, which is terrible, but I was that cut off. I'd lost most of my friends and a, a lot of close colleagues. I didn't know who to talk to. When I read Vicky's story and realised that she'd uh, found quite a lot of counsel and comfort in Ruth Hunt, the head of Stonewall, I rang Ruth and asked if I could go and speak to her. And suddenly I found myself meeting all sorts of key individuals within this part of the church, uh, not least accepting evangelicals who um, embraced me with open arms, helped me meet many other evangelical uh, gay Christians, and um, then asked if I would uh, consider being a patron for them, and indeed, right now, I've been asked if I would take that on uh, and become the new director as Benny is standing down for a bit to have a bit of a break. Uh, he's, very, he's done a fantastic job in taking us through the first 10 years, and we feel there's a very key role for us to play in these conversations. Let's be honest, it's the evangelical church, more than anyone, who need to learn how to hear and embrace each other. And we feel it's really key that we've got someone who can actually engage with the senior parts of the church and with grassroots. And it does seem like God's plan that that's a role I can play. Now, I know that in the past and possibly in the present too, you've been friends with George Carey, Rowan Williams and Jane Williams and Justin Welby. <laughs> and you've even worked closely with Justin Welby, haven't you, at Coventry? Yes, I was one of his trustees when he worked uh, there with Andrew White. Um, in fact, I was asked to do a review of the work that the International Centre were doing because we were very conscious that uh, the scale of the work had far outgrown a normal cathedral charity. Uh, Justin was very focused in Africa, Andrew on Israel, Palestine and Iraq. And actually out of that review came the decision to launch the Foundation for Reconciliation, which I led with Andrew. But it gave me the great privilege and pleasure of getting to know both of them and working quite closely with them. 
And I remember when George Carey was Archbishop and he would often extol to me your virtues and your, your exemplary evangelical orthodoxy. Yes, and uh, I, I just wonder how these people will feel now that you are kind of suddenly crossed over to, crossed over to the other side of the house, if you like, <laughs> and are now, as head of accepting evangelicals, going to be advocating for this change, which some people feel is overdue in the evangelical movement, but others feel is, other, others are still very, very much of the position that this is not a, a good thing. Mm -hmm. Many people have said that it's actually a bit like St Paul and, uh, do you know, I think more than anybody I was really concerned about George's reaction. I had grown very close to George, I was his appointment on council and he is such a wonderful, warm, gracious, humble and, and insightful leader and I was terribly concerned more than anybody of his reaction. I don't think it would be breaking too many confidence to say he wrote me the most beautiful letter and you will see my tear stains all over it as he put in major bold type, you are no disappointment, you are a child of God. And it was a very gracious, beautiful letter saying how much he himself had struggled to understand and how could he understand, uh, coming from a very um, married, conservative view, what I'd been through, um, but recognising the integrity of my faith. So uh, he himself, I'm sure, has got strong views, but what I've noticed with people like him it's very key that they love me for who I am, that they agree that um, we may have very different views, but they can, I think it's really challenged them to see what God may or may not be saying to the church at this time. And where now for the church? Is it going to find peace and unity on this issue? Well, I hope and pray so. I do believe that the process that Justin is putting forward is the right one. We need to learn how to really, truly listen and respect each other. I appreciate there's an awful lot of concern and fears around. I'm, I'm sure there will be deep, deep divisions and, and disagreement. That's okay, as long as we keep respecting and loving each other. The one thing I've noticed with the letters that I had from people who are, are, are strongly opposed uh, to, to the decision I've made, one thing that's been really key to do is to outline how much they still love me. Um, and how much um, they recognise that my faith is important to me. They can't reconcile that, but that to me gives me hope that as long as we can keep talking to each other, that God must have a way through this. It's not about right and wrong, it's about the gospel of Christ. And for me, this whole issue, frankly, is about understanding scripture, because I am truly biblically based, but I see in scripture the nature of Christ and we have to go right back to what is scripture for. It's to reveal Christ and reveal the Christ in each other. And it's that that we need to be constantly open to be challenged about.